Uh, trying, I know in everyone's uh, mind a concern is uh, when and where do I have to be here? And uh, I thought I would try to share something with you. Uh, pursuant to Rule 20C, the Rules Committee has met and the Senate Finance Committee will convene on Tuesday, May the 29th, 2018, at noon. At that time, the Senate Finance staff, <clears throat> excuse me, will do a briefing uh, on what has been delivered to us in 5001 and 5002. And the members of the Senate Finance Committee will have the opportunity to offer any amendments that they might like to 5001 and 5002. Uh, regardless of what happens at, at that point in time, there may be an opportunity for other senators to enjoy a briefing by Senate finance staff, but the most expedient thing would be if everyone who is coming here on Tuesday uh, would attend the finance committee meeting and we only have to go through that drill one time. No matter what happens, it would be the expectation at Wednesday, what time? On Wednesday, when we adjourn today, I would respectfully ask the President Pro Tem to adjourn until uh, Tuesday. What time do you want? Several hours. Several hours. Okay. Uh, that on uh, the Senate would adjourn to reconvene on Tuesday at 3 p.m. And then we would adjourn from that time on Tuesday till Wednesday at 9 a.m. And it would be my expectation that on Wednesday, which would be May the 30th, uh, that the budget issue will be addressed and resolved one way or the other. Senator from Augusta, Senator Hanger. Thank you, Mr. President. A brief point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, I rise just to basically thank everyone for their, their patience this afternoon as we work out some troublesome issues. Uh, we have, as a Senate, uh, been working diligently uh, on a budget behind the scenes. I think we are about there. That's my opinion. We've reached some tentative agreements on things that could happen. The, the courtesy now is being extended uh, to those members that want to be able to be very clear on the impact of the suggested amendments to House Bill 5001-5002 uh, as we avoid the Memorial Day weekend uh, to be back here and fully prepared uh, to address a bill in the Finance Committee uh, and with, uh, take a definitive action in reporting a bill out uh, on Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon when we convene, I would encourage some of you all to think about this. If, in fact, when we convene on Tuesday afternoon, enough of you all would be in the mind of saving yourself time and saving taxpayers the expense of keeping us up overnight, all we would need is about 28 or 30 votes, and we could suspend the rules, and we could just move on with business Tuesday afternoon and be done. Be that what it may, I would expect that we will conclude our business um, on Wednesday, uh, that we will have uh, a complete airing and vetting of the budget as, as has been prepared by many hands that, uh, that is at your disposal now, those amendments that have been prepared, and that those of you that have other ideas about what you want included in the budget will have had a very adequate opportunity to present those and will have as we deliberate here on the floor of the Senate. I would say, uh, Mr. President, that I had come here today prepared, as I thought, if necessary, to, to kind of push things along, and I think we're there. We are a cordial body, and the courtesies are being extended here today because we are a cordial body, and we will do things in a historic manner. Uh, perhaps not a historic manner, but with historic tradition in mind, I would say. We have a responsibility, and we have we have probably uh, 
push the time limit as far as we should. The governor is anxious. I just talked to him. He's extremely anxious. Uh, the House, uh, who have to agree with us, and they're not our enemy. We work with them, uh, both sides of the aisle over there. They're after the same goal that we're after, and that is a budget that effectively represents the best interests of the Commonwealth. So we need to get those attitudes out of our mind as we, we go down this final stretch and prepare a budget. I would say I would prefer that we would, have, as many of you all would, that we finish this work a month or two ago. But I also will share with you that the passage of time has actually assisted us in a few ways in terms of where we are uh, with, the, with the economy and the Commonwealth and some of the decisions that we're about to make. I'm, I am hopeful uh, that while many will be disappointed next Wednesday uh, with the action that we take, that we will take it in stride and that then we will pull together because really, I believe at this point in time, due in part to the policies that are in front of us that we're addressing and in part to the, the economy that's on the rebound and to our conservative budgeting in the past, we're going to find ourselves in a good posture uh, to do a lot of good for the citizens we represent throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Senator. Senior Senator from Fairfax, Senator Saslow. <clears throat> Mr. President, point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. I came here today um, fully expecting that this, uh, we would start the ball rolling and finish it up this week. This is basically a numbers game. I understand it and I get it. And uh, if it preserves the Senate tradition for seven more days, uh, I can live with that. But I can't live with it any longer than that. And if we don't have a bill out of committee, and I'm hopeful that we will have a bill out of committee, because uh, that's the right way to do it. But if we don't, make no mistake about it, either I or Senator Hanger will move to discharge the committee. We cannot go any longer with this. We're the only Western democracy that continues to have uh, these kinds of problems. And health care is not a privilege. It's a right. And, you know, uh, a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, a lot of us, you know, we've had a lot of breaks in our lives, okay? Um, I have. I know a lot of people in here have. And there's a lot of people out there that don't get these breaks. And they work hard, but for one reason or another, things never turn out right for them. And these are the people that need our help. Um, there was a story in the, uh, in the Washington Post today about a couple of people who work very, very hard, um, and things just haven't gone right. Uh, one fellow, uh, an African-American gentleman, uh, did everything that you could possibly expect. He was a carpenter. He did a lot of work. At age 50, his legs just gave out. Then about with prostate cancer, you can't blame this on him. These things happen, and yet he didn't have any health insurance. The bills are staggering, and I'm sure it forced him into bankruptcy. A woman who was a, um, uh, a single parent um, and a graduate of Harvard, uh, had started her own business when everything went south for her health-wise. And she wound up with no insurance and for a period of time homeless. I think she was homeless. And, um, you know, we need to help these people. And th these are just two people. There's a ton of them out there. And no other Western democracy has to worry about this except the United States. We come back here next week. One way or another, we're going to get a bill to the governor. And I would hope that you all who are opposed to this would examine your conscience. By the way, I, Mr. President, I constantly hear that, well, what happens if the federal government, you know, uh, decides not to do it? We have a kill switch in this bill, just like all the other 32 states have. If the federal government terminates the program, we terminate the program. No ifs. No ands, no buts. The U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled the federal government can't force this on the states. But nobody, nobody in this country should have to go through what some of the people have to. And one way or another, we're going to get that Medicaid expansion to the governor's desk. Thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you, Senator. Senator from James City County, Senator Norman. A uh, point of personal privilege, uh, Mr. President. Senator has the floor. Originally, I had made a note to take up two divergent issues, but uh, after listening to the eloquence of the two senators, I, I'm going in a little bit different direction. You know, I listened to the senator talking about helping these people. As the co-chairman of Senate Finance, I would say that Medicaid expansion is not a political issue with me. I'm speaking about me individually. It is a policy issue, and the potential financial ramifications of this is what causes my stewardship concern. If, in fact, we are wrong on our calculations and any adjustment is made on Medicaid reimbursement, the financial consequences are going to be horrific. Right now we get a $9 federal reimbursement for every state dollar. You drop that to eight, that is $274 million a year right there, every year. There's also some discussion, yes, there are those out there who need help, but we need to be certain that we are helping those who need help, those who choose not to help themselves. So to me, it is nothing more than a financial issue. I would say uh, someone is unduly optimistic if you thought that you were coming here today and that the rules of the Senate were going to be suspended and it was going to be wrapped up. The rules of the Senate were not going to be suspended and you should be more realistically grounded if that's what your expectation was. I would say I get very little satisfaction about what's going on, but the only modicum of satisfaction I have, I remember back to March, which is very challenging at my advanced age, and the administration and some of my friends on the other side of the aisle were saying, we got to do it now. And one of the things I was saying after listening to Secretary Aubrey Lane is, hey, in May we'll know the implications, if any, of the new tax laws. We'll know where the revenues are. No, we've got to do it now. Gracious be, you know what? This purported compromise that was worked out realizes, whoa, there is going to be a significant amount of unanticipated revenues and there is no dispute about it. You can try to move the numbers around in various blocks. But let me tell you, the compromise that was worked out took into consideration an exorbitant amount of unanticipated revenues. And I share with this body in here that Senate Finance staff has done an analysis and they expect the unanticipated revenues to be $622 million. dollars. $622 million that you would not have been having a discussion about in March. So you take that 600 number and you round it off, and then you figure, well, maybe there's 360 there in savings on Medicaid expansion. You're talking almost a billion dollars. And, you know, you can raise your eyebrows and twitch your ears, but that is a financial fact. So I suggest to you that there was some wisdom in waiting to address this budgetary issue now, I would further say <clears throat> that um, I'm not a very articulate sp spokesperson, and I certainly rec recognize that, and sometimes I don't make myself very clear, and it leads to confusion. And plus, uh, my nickname that many of you call me by is Senator Cream Puff, you know how easy I am about going on, on issues. And I don't have a J.C. Penney suit on today either. <laughs> but let me share this with you. And this is shifting to a very personal point and a point of personal privilege. One of my colleagues here reminded me a number of years ago that information is power. And there is an unquenchable thirst of information in the old GAB that has managed to 
float its way across the street into the Pocahontas building, and you have legislators and sycophants out there who want to try to get some information because it raises their esteem and their level of importance amongst their colleagues, and it leads to all kinds of rumor mongering or what some would refer to as fake news. This is very personal to me. And right here in front of all of you and my unbeloved friends of the fourth estate, I want to make something really clear. It was announced at a reception in the governor's mansion last week that this Medicaid expansion negotiations were going on at my behest. That it was going on that I was requesting it and that I was giving a wink and a nod. That is fake news. And if you have any doubt about it, I would suggest that you ask directly one of the individuals involved in the negotiations on it. I further heard that it was being negotiated because the Republican Senate leadership wanted it to happen, but they couldn't do it for political reasons. Absolute, total distortion. Now it has evolved even further, even further. You know, I was coming in today and I was thinking about Chris Christopherson who sang a song about the silver-tongued devil and uh, uh, the smile of an angel. Well, I can tell you there's some silver-tongued devils walking around in these buildings who are propagating absolute falsehoods. The most recent one is, and I've gotten text today, that now they have started rumor-mongering that I am going to retire because of what has happened that I am so embarrassed by what has happened that now I am going to retire. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'm going to be here in 2019 and 2020 to kick your ass. <laughs> so let there be no mistake about that rumor. Let, let, the, let, the, let there be no mistake about those rumors. I haven't given anybody a wink and a nod to negotiate on behalf of myself. There's been no wink or a nod from the Senate Republican leadership that has acquiesced in encouraging this. And I have no intentions of retiring, even if- Shame the, on you all. Do your job. Every week, 11 more Virginians die because you keep- Senate will come to order. You know, I really, I have enormous respect for people who have a difference of opinion, but when I hear someone like that who violates the decorum and is so passionate and blinded in their approach, it only makes me that more adamant in my position. So I appreciate uh, very much uh, the point of personal privilege. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint some of you to let you know that I intend to be back, but I'll still be Senator Cream Puff. Senior Senator from Fairfax, Senator Sasslaw. Mr. President, I just have one question. Um, Senator, is the floor. I, can somebody kindly explain to me in here when the majority leader morphed into Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> Senator from Hampton, Senator Locke. Mr. President, a point of personal privilege. Senator, is the floor. Mr. President, I would like to share uh, a brief uh, excerpt from um, the message of the city manager uh, from the city of Hampton in introducing the city's budget. Uh, she indicated that this budget has been prepared without an adopted state budget. That leaves some uncertainties on city operations and a greater potential impact on our school, on our school division. However, we have prepared the city's budget assuming no additional state funding than what we received in fiscal year 2018. And we still prepared recommended amendments since once we will prepare recommended amendments once the state situation is resolved. 
Our localities are waiting for us to be fiscally responsible. We sit here in our lofty ivory tower being fiscally irresponsible as without passing a budget, our primary responsibility here as legislators. I also want to share a letter from Patty Nelson of Loudoun County. She indicates that I'm a mom, a union member, and a psychiatric nurse who works as a program manager of nursing services for Loudoun County. My colleagues and I are on the front lines of the battle against opioid addiction, mental illness, and chronic disease. We have a message for our elected officials in Richmond. Expand Medicaid now. Here in Loudoun, the richest county in the nation, half of those seeking treatment for mental illness and addiction have no health insurance and limited income. We do our best to provide treatment. However, those with serious mental illness also have higher rates of cr serious chronic medical illnesses, such as heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and more. Medicaid expansion would give us the tools to save lives and help those in, in our community suffering from mental illness and addiction get back on their feet. Right now, our safety net is full of holes. We refer people to clinics with sliding scales, but often they still can't afford the fees of medicine. Going to emergency rooms for medical crises, they leave without, it, without access to ongoing treatment and medical bills that are financially devastating for themselves and their families. This is not happening to nameless, faceless people. This is happening to friends and neighbors. It almost happened to me. Eight years ago, my husband passed away. For several years before that, we did not have insurance and he was not able to get the medical care he needed. I am a recent breast cancer survivor. If I had gotten cancer during the time he, we were uninsured, I wouldn't have had a mammogram. I wouldn't have had life-saving surgery or radiation. I wouldn't have had medicine to prevent the cancer from coming back. As a nurse, union member, and a mom, I say it's time to end the unnecessary suffering that is a result of years of delay in expanding Medicaid. I have heard the false argument that we can't implement a program until fraud, waste, and abuse is addressed. The truth is that Medicaid is an, efficient, is an effective, efficiently run program. I believe the true fraud, waste, and abuse is the unnecessary suffering of the 400,000 Virginians who have been denied access to health care coverage, the millions of dollars we have lost, and the strain put on local governments and frontline health care staff to do our jobs without the needed resources. Our elected officials in Richmond, and that would be us, have a chance to end the unnecessary suffering. It's time they pass a clean Medicaid expansion. It's time for us to do our jobs, not only to pass Medicaid expansion, but to pass a budget. That's what we were sent here to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Rockingham, Senator Obenshane. Mr. President, point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I will try to be brief. I've got a couple of things that I wasn't planning to say. However, uh, given the uh, comments that have emanated from across the other side of the aisle, I think that it's only fair that I point out a couple of things. First of all, I, I uh, was disappointed to uh, see and hear the heckler's veto come into this chamber. Uh, it is something that I find deeply disturbing about the uh, the manner in which we engage in civil discourse in this country, particularly in, on college and university campuses, I hope that it's something that will not be repeated. I hope that people will uh, respect the decorum of this body. Moreover, I think that, I think that it's important for us to uh, set an example and anybody who comes in here to set an example and uh, engage in that kind of uh, uh, appropriate civil discourse in which we are respectful of one another's views and are willing to listen. Uh, with that in mind, I've got a couple of things that I do want to say. Uh, this is not a contest between good and evil. I tell people all the time who tell us, uh, you know, I, I suspect that many members of this body have similar questions when school groups and civic groups come down and talk to us. They say, uh, number one question I get is, hey, how come you guys can't just get along? 
And the dirty little secret is we do get along. We get along pretty darn well. 90% of the issues that we deal with, we deal with uh, collaboratively. We work together to find solutions that work for Virginians. Uh, and we do it in a way that crosses partisan lines, trying to help people. And uh, uh, those are just problem solving. Uh, they don't have uh, policy slants. They don't really reflect liberal and conservative views. They aren't Republican or Democrat issues. But then we've got 5% of the things that we deal with that, that I call cats and dogs issues. They are the reason why we have two political parties. They are the reason why we have Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, people with different views on fundamental issues. I go back and, you know, I remember a time in this country in the 1970s, I feel that there are a handful of people in here who probably don't remember those times, but in the 1970s, we were dealing with uh, inflation that was spiraling. It was crushing families. I remember uh, we were dealing with unemployment, with price controls, uh, people who were being thrown out of jobs, uh, families who were really struggling to pay for gasoline, to pay for everything. And we had people in Washington who were, you know, I think, adrift. They were agog with some of the ideas that had emanated during the Great Society and even dating back to the New Deal. And we had uh, Washington and government really trying to determine the direction of too many things. And uh, one of the things that I think was an economic slap in the face for America, a wake-up call, so to speak, was this great economic lesson that was given to Americans through uh, this wonderful television show. Ironically, it was on public broadcasting by Milton and Rose Friedman called Free to Choose. And Milton Friedman uh, really spoke a lot of truth that a lot of Republicans and Democrats came to hear and understand. And one of the things that he said was uh, he delivered a couple of maxims. One is there are efficient ways to spend money and there are really inefficient ways to spend money. The most efficient way that people spend money is when we spend our own hard-earned money on ourselves. We are much more careful when we do that. The worst way to spend money is when government spends other people's money on other people. It is terrible. It does a terrible job of efficiently using those resources and it creates all kinds of perverse incentives. The second thing, second maxim that Milton Friedman delivered was uh, that we do a terrible job in government of re-examining the premises upon which a lot of our social welfare policies are built. What we do is we, we find a problem whether it's housing, whether it is unemployment, or even, yes, health care. And somebody, some bureaucrat, some uh, elected official, some executive, comes up with a policy, a program, in order to eradicate that problem. And that program is passed and adopted. And inevitably, it's supposed to wipe out that problem. And inevitably, we come back five years later, and the problem's there. It's typically worse. It's bigger. And the response is always, well, if you weren't so parsimonious in the first place, if you just spent more money and created a bigger program, and if you'll spend that more money now, we'll solve that problem. And that is exactly what we're about to do with Medicaid. It is spending other people's money, spending the taxpayer's money on other people. It is the most inefficient way to spend money. And this plan, as it's conceived, and granted I haven't had a whole lot of time to look at the 300 pages of amendments that have been put together over the past couple of weeks in the uh, negotiations that have taken place outside of the structure of our finance committee, but it is spending other people's money on other people without any of the assurances that promote any kind of positive incentive. And it is expanding a fundamentally broken program. Uh, Medicaid is hurting people in Virginia. It is hurting people. It is hurting the people who are struggling to pay their health insurance, who are struggling to pay their premiums. It's hurting the people who are struggling with high deductibles. And you know what this is going to do is it is a repeating cycle. What we are doing is we are providing people with Medicaid coverage that shifts the cost of health care to those 
people who are already struggling to pay their health insurance premiums, who are already struggling to pay the deductibles, and it puts more pressure on them. And let me tell you, mark my words, we will be back in three or four years because we are going to be creating a new class of people for whom Medicaid needs to be expanded in three or four years. And there are many people, on, maybe on the other side of the aisle, but certainly with a different political viewpoint than I do, who think that's a marvelous idea, that we ought to be creating a universal government-funded health care system. And that is what this proposal is headed towards. It is part of that initiative. It is wrong-minded. It is not helping people. If you wanted to help people who were, uh, who were struggling to pay their health insurance, who were struggling to pay those deductibles, uh, the uh, gentleman up the street here would have signed those three bills that were geared towards helping working Virginians meet those obligations and ease that burden and create fewer people who are struggling under uh, the uh, problems imposed by this system. Uh, you know, it's most unfortunate that those bills were vetoed. Uh, those would have helped real Virginians. This is simply the wrong way. It's not that the folks on that side of the aisle are evil people. And I don't think a single person over here is an evil person because they don't believe that this is the right way to solve our health care access problem in this country or the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's the wrong way to go. Senator from Prince William County, Senator McPike. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise for the point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, today in the gallery I introduced... Uh, to this body, if, if you are paying attention, uh, Kara Murdoch, who is a paramedic. It is EMS week. She lost her arm as an amputee now. And it's simple. I wouldn't describe her service or her actions or the person she is as inefficient or a freeloader or by any means describe her as in any form as a terrible way to spend money on her because her first words when she met with me is, I want a job, I need a new hand, and I need some basic covers to stabilize myself to work. If you actually spend time to talk to people about this issue, on the other side of the aisle on this, these are real people with real stories and real challenges. They didn't ask for this. They didn't sign up to become an amputee and then to become and described by some here as a freeloader? No, Mr. President, absolutely not. A couple things and a couple stats about the debate of the finances that have been going on. It's now been 73 days since we adjourned. It's been 35 days since the House has passed the budget. And folks, it's been eight years since the federal government passed the enabling legislation. This math isn't new. Virginians like Kara are waiting, and they deserve better. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Rico, Senator Donovan. Good evening, Mr. President. I rise Senator. for uh, personal privilege. Senator has the floor. I'll say just simply and briefly, I promise, building a little bit on what the Senator from Rockbridge said, that often when I'm asked about the Senate, I, um, I will say that... Both sides of the aisle got along very well, very respectfully, in a very dignified way, not necessarily as we see reflected in public discourse about politics. And I will say, you know, I think we generally agree on the problems and the heartfelt concern for the individuals with the problems. We sometimes just disagree on a solution. But I never, ever suggest that somebody who has a different solution than I do, Mr. President, perhaps has an intent that is less than mine, or perhaps that they need to examine their conscience. And I think if we want to continue the conversation on how we work together to solve problems, we need to remove some of those disparaging comments that we have sometimes here on the floor, and we need to focus on solving those problems and talking about why we disagree and maybe where we can go together. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Senator. Senator from Northern Fairfax, Senator Howe. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Thanks. Senator, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I hope the press is watching, and I hope the people of Virginia are watching, because we need to cast a bright spotlight on what's happening here. We have the minority, a minority of the Senate of Virginia delaying and obstructing the will of the majority of the Senate of Virginia, the will of the House of Delegates, the will of the majority of the House of Delegates, the will of the governor, and most importantly, the overwhelming will of Virginians. Virginians overwhelmingly want Medicaid expansion. And while we're diddling and dawdling here on the Senate floor, people are suffering, some people are dying, and we diddle and we dawdle and we delay. I think it's time, Mr. President, that we get real here and do what we know has to be done and pass the budget and help Virginians. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Senator. Senator from Arlington, Senator Favola. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise on a point of personal privilege. Thank the Senator. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I had not planned on speaking today, but this does seem to be a robust conversation on Medicaid expansion and fiscal responsibility. And I, I, I do have to note that every single day, taxpayers' dollars from Virginia, $5.6 million, leaves our state and goes, and goes to the government to support Medicaid expansion in 32 other states. From a dollars and cents standpoint, forget the human impact. Just from a dollars and cents standpoint, we have an obligation to ensure that our tax dollars are used effectively, to ensure that we can leverage federal dollars, to ensure that our Virginians have an opportunity to access care when they are first sick. So they don't have to wait until their condition gets so severe they end up going to the emergency room, and there they are, with the worst outcome because they waited too long, the cost of care at its most expensive point, and that cost is spread to all of us who have insurance. If we truly care about slowing the rate of increase in insurance, ladies and gentlemen, you insure more people. Then you have less people going to the doctor when they don't have money to pay for the care. You insure more people. Arkansas had the slowest rate of increase in their insurance premiums, Arkansas, because they did participate in Medicaid expansion. Now, it was a very different program because you know what? I think we can come together under an amendment to our Medicaid plan because we have a lot of latitude and how we shape that amendment. And we can come to agreement on that. We can agree that managed care makes sense. We can agree that the healthcare system should be focused more on outcomes than on uh, individual doctor's visits. We can agree that we can get more efficiencies. We're all in favor of those things. And at the end of the day, we'll be helping working Virginians and their families access health care. It is time, it is really time to act. These facts have been out there. We've been studying this. We've looked at this. The dollars and cents are there. We'd be able to gain more money in our budget. We'd be able to help our K through 12 system. We'd be able to help higher education. We could do more for public safety. And yes, we could do a lot more for the opioid crises and mental health services. These are, these are issues where we've agreed upon. Why don't we just take that next step? Let's search for the best. Let's find the best in us. I do hope we can act in seven days. I don't know how much more information we need, but whatever it is, I do hope that somehow we all become enlightened and we can act next week. I will take the majority leader at his word. I am not happy about this delay, but I do understand how the Senate reveres its, its traditions. I do understand that. 
I reluctantly will go along, but we have to act next week. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Senator. Senator from Grayson, Senator Carrico. Mr. President, point of personal privilege. Senator, has the floor. Since, you, since uh, I was kept here an hour longer, I just thought I'd go ahead and speak. Uh, delay my trip home. Uh, you know, it's funny that I get to uh, sit here and be lectured by the other side about people dying every day, but yet you're the ones who fund Planned Parenthood. You're the ones that believe in, abort in abortion. Uh, you're the ones who uh, millions of babies die every day, those that are not able-bodied to defend themselves. It's amazing that I sit here and get lectured by that side of the aisle on these very issues Yet you talk about uh, all that uh, Medicaid expansion is going to do, but you don't look at the other states that have expanded Medicaid and the cost that it's uh, brought against those states. You use Kentucky as a model. Kentucky began in 08 at $4.8 billion uh, for the Medicaid uh, uh, program, and now it's $9.9 billion. So you don't look at the numbers as they grow. You don't look at the fact that the uh, individual out there, the single individual that may be making 21 or 22,000 with no kids are going to shoulder the bill for this. They're going to shoulder the bill. The, the, the single parent that makes over 30,000, they're going to shoulder the bill for this. You don't think about those people because it's all about the agenda that you want to expand Medicaid, Virginia will be back here in another year looking at a tax increase, which I know you don't care that you put on the burden of the people, yet we are asked to have this shoved down our throats, and you're going to lecture me about the lives that are being lost when you're the ones, you're the party that believes in the abortion in the aborting of individuals uh, and Planned Parenthood that allows it, that's in the budget that you want. So uh, I appreciate the lecture before I leave to drive home, but I'll think about that for the next five hours as I'm driving. Senator from Southern Fairfax, Senator Barker. Uh, Mr. President, rising for a point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, I'll try to be uh, brief here. Uh, there's been reference made uh, in the uh, speaking today regarding the effectiveness of government uh, to be able to help people. Uh, it's part of our responsibility to make sure that those people who need assistance are, are helped. And I could tell you, I can uh, uh, provide information that shows that in many instances, what we do, we do extraordinarily well as government in Virginia. Uh, we have a number of uh, areas where our government is among the national leaders. Uh, one of those actually is in terms of operation of our Medicaid program. We frequently are recognized for the uh, leadership that, that Virginia has provided uh, across the country that is now in many instances being copied by other states. And as an indication of the uh, efficiency in which the Virginia Medicaid program uh, operates and the, its effectiveness in controlling costs and in some instances reducing costs, I just want to briefly provide a little bit of information uh, regarding how much is spent for those people who are on Medicaid. For low-income adults, which is actually the population that largely would be covered under Medicaid expansion, over the last six years, the amount spent per individual has gone down every single year. Over this six-year period from 2011 to 23, 2017, the amount spent per individual has decreased 42%, uh, which is a huge decrease, averaging out to about nine percentage point, on average, about nine percentage point decrease per year. From $6,741 per individual to less than $4,000, a total of $3,912. Uh, for low-income children, which is the largest uh, share of individuals who are covered under Medicaid right now, uh, but also has the lowest, expendi has the lowest uh, expenditure per, uh, per individual, the increase, there has been an increase over the last uh, seven years, but that increase has been 1% per year. For the disabled, it's been about an increase of about 3.5% a year, largely as a result of the increasing number of waiver slots that we have, uh, have funded here. And for the people who are elderly and receiving long-term care services, it's been an increase of about 4% a year. 
Medicaid in Virginia is an efficiently run program operated to a large extent through the state, but employing managed care companies and the private sector in provision of services. It's been effective in helping people receive the care they need. It's been effective in holding down cost, and in many instances has been help effective in actually reducing cost. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before the Senate? Senior Senator from Fairfax, Senator Saslaw. himself why all the health wagons are down there in southwest Virginia and not up in Fairfax County. Yeah, well, I can answer that. Senator from Franklin County, Senator Stanley. Thank you, Mr. President. Right for a point of personal privilege. Senator has the floor. After just hearing that from uh, my good friend, the senior senator from Fairfax County, uh, I, get, I also, too, get a little bit tired about the lecture, especially about what our needs in Southside and Southwest Virginia are. Many of you in the prosperous parts of Virginia wonder why, why, oh why, would senators from Southside and Southwest be even opposed to Obamacare's expansion of Medicaid in our regions? After all, you all like to remind us that those Senate districts, whether it's mine, the senators from Grayson, or Senator Russell, would see the highest enrollments in the state under the Virginia Medicaid expansion program. Now, to the senior senator from Fairfax, I appreciate your notion of charity government charity. But once again, as we've always said here, it is always the government that has known what's best for us in Southside and Southwest Virginia, and that more government dependency is great. But more government dependency is what has gotten our areas into the current economic conditions in the first place. I've stood on this floor, and I've educated you over and over. I've tried to tell you about how our fortunes were, how Southside and Southwest was the industrial leader of Virginia. I have lived in Southside and Southwest. I have lived in Virginia Beach. I have lived in Northern Virginia. I remind you that in 1978, your number one industry was dairy, while our number one industries were textile, tobacco, manufacturing, coal. Just 30 or 40 years ago, we were the powerhouse. We had the highest per capita income, highest graduation rates, lowest poverty rates. Lowest unemployment rates, lower than Northern Virginia, lower than Hampton Roads. Now we have the highest. You know why? Because the government said to us with NAFTA and CAFTA, look, that's bad. We want free, we want cheaper sneakers. We're going we're gonna to open up this and it'll be great for you and it'll be better for you. And there went our jobs. There went our mills. There went our textiles. Then tobacco was bad for you. We're going to pay you a little subsidy not to grow it. Guess what? Our small farmers closed up. You see, the government, whether it be the state or at the federal level, has continued to tear down the economic foundation of our region and over time has replaced a once vibrant economy full of hope and freedom with government dependency. Our populations are now shrinking. The Dependency on opioids is through the roof. We used to have at one time, Martinsville used to be had the cutting edge hospital in the Commonwealth of Virginia some 30 to 40 years ago. Now we do not. Because as our population declined, as our jobs went away, as uh, our populations lessened, the doctors went where the jobs were and where the population was. They went elsewhere where the economy was thriving. The government has repeatedly told us that everything's going to be all right. Here's a little dependency for you. Here's a displaced worker program for you. Here's some entitlements. Here's some welfare. Here's some Medicaid. And as government dependency grow, so did poverty, despair, and addiction in our areas. As our population has dispersed, the brain drain has occurred. It used to be we could watch our kids grow and watch their kids grow across the street. Now we have to go across the state or across the country to see them. So when you say that you would, you and Southside and Southside, why would you not want more government dependency and charity as you now think that we deserve and should be grateful for, we tell you that we already have it. We have too much of it. And we've had enough of it. We're a proud area, 
And let me tell you one thing. When you look at our Senate districts and you say, but Ms. Senator Stanley's district will have 12,500 more Medicaid recipients and beneficiaries due to expansion. Let me tell you. Let me just tell you. Of the total population of my district of 201,889, 61,910 of my citizens are already on Medicaid. It's a 31% of the population. You add that 12,500, it's 37% of the population. One out of three. I could go on. There's over 51,000 in the senator from Grayson's. Over 51,000 in the senator from Russell's. Over 167,000 combined in three Senate districts alone. And in comparison, some of your districts in Northern Virginia have 6% of your population on Medicaid. We have it. We know what it's like. We have a sister or a brother or a cousin or a friend on a neighbor on it. We know that less than 50% of our doctors even take it. We don't have the specialists that you have. And if we do have a specialist, chances are they don't take it because they don't have to take Medicaid. The only people that have to take, the only thing that has to take Medicaid is a hospital. Think about it. When you add to the roles, you're going to add to the pressure of an already stressed out medical system in the south side and southwest regions. Why do you not have more than 30% in your northern Virginia re and districts on Medicaid already? Because you have what we are asking for, which is an economy. If you want to bring quality health care to the people of south side and southwest Virginia who built this commonwealth then work on an economic solution to bring jobs and prosperity and economic revitalization back to us. Because guess what? When you had economic prosperity and revitalization, the doctors came in. You can pay them higher salaries. When there are people working and the, law, and the employment levels are low and the income levels per capita are high, because right now a family of four in my area, the average is $28,000 compared to the state average of 70. If you could get us up even to the state average, through infrastructure and economic prosperity, workforce training. Guess what? Doctors are going to come in. People are going to be able for quality health care, not Medicaid. We don't want dependency anymore. And you can put the time out all you want and breathe heavy and sigh all you want, Senior Senator from Fairfax. I will not be silenced because I'm tired of being lectured to myself. We have enough of it. We have enough government dependency. Government dependency breeds more government dependency and takes away freedom because that's its intent. And Benjamin Franklin said, a man that trades liberty for security has none and deserves neither. And we're going to refuse. And that's why nobody down in my area, I'm telling you, a great portion of my area rejects this government dependency. They want independency. We'd like quality doctors coming down. We can't even get them down in our area because we can't afford them, can't pay for, pay for them. We'd love that. And you know what makes that happen? Jobs. Prosperity. We had it once. We had the best doctors in the world, had the best hospitals in the world. Now you got them. Let's work on making sure everyone in the Commonwealth of Virginia has good doctors and good hospitals and good jobs. And so we don't need this dependency we don't need this expansion that you think is a panacea. That's the solution. Not some Band-Aid on a gaping head wound like Medicaid expansion is. We need a comprehensive solution to a health care issue and when we're in a greater level to an economic issue. Come down and visit us if you dare. We are looking forward to having one of your senators from Northern Virginia come visit us and we cannot wait to demonstrate to her how great the people are, but how we're through with the government dependency that has put us in this position. We've had enough. And so when you ask me why we're not for Medicaid expansion, it is not because we don't like Barack Obama. Barack Obama was a president. It's not because we think that Medicaid was some evil institution we could, and that it's a partisan issue. It's not. We know what Medicaid is. Low quality, low quality health care. Doctors that take it, they're getting reimbursed 38 bucks for that visit, $38. Doctors got you turn you through just to make money on that day. 
Hospitals are the ones making money off of it because they made a bad deal in Obamacare. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be intellectually honest. As I promise, I will finish with this, and I want to tell you, let's be intellectually honest with ourselves. See all those radio ads you're hearing about it? It's the hospitals. You know why? Because the hospitals nationwide made a deal in the ACA which said they would trade $750 billion a year, three-quarters of a trillion dollars from Medicare, not Medicaid, Medicare, care for the elderly, that which comes out of your paycheck every pay period, and they would then use that to subsidize the insurance companies, but instead, we will expand coverage of Medicaid to 100 to 138 percent above the poverty level, and you'll make more money. That was the deal. But on the hospital side, they didn't have a constitutional scholar like the senator from James City, who might have told them the Supreme Court might overrule that part because it's a volunteer program. No state is compelled to take it. <clears throat> and ultimately... That's what the Supreme Court did. So the money went away, the $750 billion, but they never had the makeup. So they need, this is not a coverage gap. This is a hospital gap. They need us to use taxpayer dollars to make up for the bad deal they made with the Obama administration. That's not what we're here for. Thank you. Clerk will report any announcements on the desk.